So we're hoping to have a conversation this morning on what you learn from each other, how advice goes both ways. <laughs> and also, I just sort of want to know what it was like growing up in Nancy Pelosi's home. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start with you, Alexander, on that note. So your mom um, is a noted um, advocate for women since she's been in Congress, um, and probably before. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a book on it, and, and she has said in her book, for our daughters and our granddaughters, now the sky is the limit. Is that the message you had growing up? Or did that message come later? OK, this is so. Let's just talk. <laughs> I, I feel like I, we have to set some picture, please, of what please. it was like. First of all, what you might not understand is that she was not, not working until I went off to Congress. Wait, she went to Congress when I Senior in high school. Well, well let's put it this way. <laughs> you answer, and then I'll tell you when I went off to Congress. <laughs> OK, so she please. wasn't working yeah. when we were growing up. She was a stay-at-home mom. She baked cakes and made Halloween costumes, <laughs> and she cooked. Hard to and imagine. She was a stay-at-home right. mom. For our, that's all I knew her as. I was the youngest of five children, and we only knew her as the woman driving carpool. She, <laughs> ha, and when she was 46 years old, well, you tell the story. Well, when I was 46 years old, the, uh, which they refer to as late in life, <laughs> <laughs> that had the opportunity to run for Congress. And uh, I had absolutely no interest in running for Congress or running for any political office, for that matter. I had been active in the political party. I was chair of the California Democratic Party. But it was all volunteers. It's all volunteers. So we didn't think of her as someone who was working, because she did it when we she were in school. Yeah, yeah. She was dabbling. She was dabbling. So uh, in any case, uh, the opportunity came to run for Congress. The person who was a member insisted that I run in her place. And, and I was, it was a whole new thought to me, because that was not my uh, idea or thought or even, it was out of the question. So, but, but since she asked me and she was insistent and this or that, I went to Alexandra, who, our four children were in college. Mind you, five and six years. The day I brought Alexandra home from the hospital, my youngest, our oldest, turned six that week. So this was close, close in age. So anyway, I go to, before her in college, I go to Alexandra, who's going to be, who's 16, but she was young and she was going to be a senior in high school. And I said, Alexandra, with all the sincerity and, well, authenticity, really, I, Alexandra, mommy has this chance to run for um, Congress, but it, it would be better if it were one year from now when you were going to be in college, but it's now, but I love my life. and. Uh, if, if it's up to you if you want me to be home with you. That's perfect for me. But um, it, otherwise, I have this opportunity to run for Congress, thinking this was really a sincere question to her. To which she looked up to me and said, Mother, get a life. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what teenage girl wouldn't want her mother out of the house for three or four days a week? <laughs> And uh, it was so stunning to me because it didn't take her a nanosecond to respond. So I did. I mean, I had a life, but I had another life by running for Congress. But that was the, that was the, the breakaway for me, I think, was harder than it was for Alexandra. <laughs> it wasn't hard at all. So from then, uh, I went on uh, to. Uh, but when I was first in Congress for, for a few years, Alexandra told me how she, proud she was of me because I was a pioneer. All right, because she stopped cooking before all the other moms did. <laughs> she, she used to cook, and, and then one day she just stopped cooking. <laughs> and she decided she was going to go, and it wasn't takeout, like fast food. She, she started by getting food to bring home from nice restaurants and then putting it on the table as if she had cooked it. <laughs> and then eventually, over time, she just um, sort of gave up on that. And that was, there were certain pieces of evidence that she was sort of um, moving on with her life after having, I thought that going to Congress was like her empty nest syndrome. It was like she had some time, because you know, my, everyone had gone away to college, and it was just the two of us and my dad, and so I think she had more free time on her hands. And it, so when you have the conversation about work-life balance, I don't know that yeah. she really understands it the way it is today, because yeah. now, you know, she has a life that's all-consuming, but it's, 
the second act of her life. Right. Well, yeah. you well, so mm -hmm. you had it. You've mm -hmm. had it all, but in two segments. Yes. And that's a different generation, of course. Right. I'm in awe of the young women today. Well, that's Carrie, what I was going to ask you. Yeah. If you were raising your daughters today, and you raised four daughters. And one son. And one son. Sorry, I don't want to leave it out. <laughs> how would you do it differently? I mean, you know, what advice would you give them? I mean, they have to work today almost to kind of make yeah. it. Well, the, the, uh, they also want to work because they have their own aspirations and the rest. But uh, I am in awe of all of you. My, Terry McAuliffe, who used to work for me and head up my San Francisco office, my four daughters who work and who have children, I, I just could never have done that. But here's what I would say to you, because I was listening to a previous conversation. Do not ever underestimate the quality of the time that you spend with your family as part of your career. This is one of the hardest jobs in the world to raise a family. It really is, I mean, you have so many personalities to deal with. You have schedule, you have tasking, you have, you have you're, you're, you're actually an editor because you're making choices and editing out certain things. You're an engineer, a housekeeping engineer. You're so many things. And don't any, let anybody ever trivialize that time. That counts on your resume as something very, very important, should you decide, because everybody's decision is the right one for them, should you decide, I'm going to have my babies, I'm going to get them off to school, and then I'm going to have a career, or go back to a career, or I'm going to do a career for a while and then have children and then go back. Whatever it is, whatever works for you is the right way to go. And as, as I say to people, you may want to have mentors and you may want to admire some other people for what they have done but understand the authentic you and whatever works for you in your timing, in your schedule, in your life, in the choices that you have. And, and with this balance of home and work, I say to my kids, I said it to them, them and I, about me, and I'll say it to them, them now, and I say it to you, just you do the best you can. It may not be the best you know how. You may say, if I really had this under control, I'd be, you know, doing this, that, and that, baking three cakes a day and, you know, all that. But that's okay because on balance it will all turn out uh, to be the best uh, that you can do. And, and that's really a good thing. But don't try to idealize it and say, you know, if, if I had this a little better under control, I could do these other five things. That doesn't matter. But what, you always say that we made a mistake because we didn't get help. Oh, get help. That, that's two words. Get help. <laughs> I didn't get help. But when, see what I, I always thought, I want the best for my children. And that means their mom taking care of them all the time. So I had one and then two and then three. And then by then I really needed help. But they don't come anywhere near your house. No babysitter, no housekeeper, <laughs> no nobody. And, and uh, I remember once pushing my stroller in New York City, Terry, three little girls all smocked dresses, you know, I paid the lady in the basement to iron them who worked for somebody else in the building in New York. And this woman came up to me. She had twin boys. And I was expecting my, what would be my son, the fourth. And she came up to me and she said, I, I just, I watch you come and go. I just have two words to say to you. Get help. <laughs> Get help. Uh, borrow money from a bank. Sell your furniture. <laughs> do whatever you have to do, but get help. And you know, it was really good advice because by the time I had the fourth and then the fifth, people would not even come near your house. They'd come for interviews, you know, oh, would you like to be a no pair or stay, live with us or something? But then they'd practically run out the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe you'd see them on the street or something and they'd go blocks away to avoid even having to face you because they were never. If you could work for a family with one child or two children, or maybe even three. Why would you even go near a house with five kids six years apart? So really, it, it, it doesn't mean you have to get help for the children, but there are other tasks in the house that have nothing to do with the character building of your children. And, and you know, get help with some of that. I always thought if I had a, somebody who drove and cooked, life would be beautiful, but life was beautiful anyway. Well, I remember when um, that time when that woman came to the house and yeah, well, we, so I said to the kids, 
<laughs> this was horrible. You, I shouldn't even tell this in public. Promise me you won't tell anybody. But how do you know she's not here? <laughs> no, she's not here. So, <laughs> so I said to the kids, I said, you know, we have this beautiful life, and you all take care of your, your room, you fix up your room, you know, even as little kids. In fact, one of my friends said to me when I went to Congress, I knew you were going places when you had your three old children folding their own laundry out of the dryer. <laughs> But they were all very well organized, and they had their responsibilities. And so, but when we would, I would be interviewing somebody to come, and, you know, a pair, whatever, they would go wild. They'd be running around the house and this or that. Well, maybe they always were, but I noticed it more then. And I said, it's a little overwhelming to people. So when we have somebody, mommy's interviewing somebody, just remain calm. Just the way, <laughs> just remain calm, just remain calm. So. That, so Jerry Brown was governor at the time, my friend, and uh, I was a state chair, or whatever, maybe northern chair, and he called me and said, this lady has used your name as a reference. Will you interview her because she wants to be appointed to a commission, so uh, an important commission ship, the, like the chair of the commission in California. It's a very big job, and I'd like to, uh, I couldn't really remember her. He said, well, interview her and let me know what you think. So she comes to the house, and we're sitting there in, in the living room, and Two of them come in, my son and one of, two of my other little girls come in, little come in like this, good evening, mother. <laughs> <laughs> and then says to the lady, are you going to be our new maid? <laughs> and of course, we never use the word maid. I mean, we were never looking for a maid. So it was like, oh my God. <laughs> Said, I don't think so. <laughs> she was one of the most glamorous, she still is one of the most glamorous, wonderful, well dressed <laughs> women, yeah. um, women. But tell them, I mean, and we're so, I'm so proud of my daughters how they manage it all. It's just a remarkable thing to me. I'm in awe of all of you. I could never have done that. I, I wanted to ask you about that. All right, so you grew up in this home where she, and, I, and we're underestimating her a little bit. I mean, Mrs. Posey was extremely active in the 80s, and <laughs> she's kind of, she didn't just dabble. She was running democratic politics, but um, but She still, did use us as her props. catering. Like, <laughs> she would have, like, events. At, like in, Now, in hindsight, I think about it. She had events at the house, because I remember Jerry Brown being there, and I remember where she would make us be the catering department. <laughs> and she would send us to the bagel store to get bagels, and then one person would be in charge of the bagels and putting the cream cheese on the bagel. And the she did um, have little events, and we, we would walk around serving it. Like five, six years old, I'd be walking around the party <laughs> serving people. But it wasn't, it did, it wasn't all consuming the way, mm -hmm. and she didn't talk about it the way, you know. But you looked at her as a homemaker. Oh, yeah. So how did you get... I still do. You still we do. were just at Thanksgiving. And she has, it's, in her, it's the 50s housewife. It just, she automatically 50s, goes back into... I was a 50s the, teenager. I wasn't a 50s housewife. Okay. A 70s housewife. <laughs> she would go into the kitchen and she would be serving. And, you know, she would be, everybody would be there, all, like, 20 of us. And, and every meal, all she did was cook one meal, then clean up and prepare for the next meal. That's why her nails aren't... This is just last her. week. Yeah, like, <laughs> she still has it in her that when she goes home, she, which is, people think in our house we have the most interesting political conversations at the dinner table. And people don't understand that when she gets home, all she wants to do is just relax and talk about the kids and retreat into her family life. And so she cooks and cleans and she just reverts to that. Uh, not so much on the cleaning anymore. Well, <laughs> last week she was all over it. And so, for example, Thanksgiving, she made the kids go to St. Anthony's Dining Room. To, to, so my little kids who are six and seven, they're out serving the little kids. And, and she's teaching them about how lucky we are and how grateful we should be, and all of the good lessons that she wants to teach them about being a member of society. We didn't do that when we were kids. We were more sort of, um, so she wasn't that politically active or I wanted to ask you about, the, the, that's a very good point you're on now. I mean, some mothers sometimes impart different wisdom to grandchildren, right. and you mm -hmm. have one vision of her. Now she's, you know, this powerhouse, so how is she interacting with her grandchildren? What does she tell the grandkids that she didn't tell you? Well, she tells them about the world. So my five-year-old was in Time Magazine last month talking about Iran because they have conversations. Syria. Yeah. Oh, Syria. Syria. Sorry. Syria. <laughs> <laughs> so she has real conversations with them about what's going on in the world, and she wants them to know about the idea that there's one in five children that don't have a meal at night and how lucky they should be about that. When we were little, she wasn't, um, I wouldn't say that. She was really focused on just doing our homework, 
She baked, she won prizes for her cakes in the cake baking contests. Second place. Oh, she was really. <laughs> she won recipes after this. Right. So she was really. So there's definitely two different. Um, I would say two different expectations. Right. And do you but she has four daughters, and all four of her daughters have children, and they found work situations that worked for them. Mm -hmm. And so I think everybody role modeled themselves after the first version of their mother, not the I'm going to go take over the world second act version of their mother. Oh, okay. That's what I was going to ask. But right. still, but everybody developed careers. Everybody developed careers, but in their own time and in their own way and things that made them close to, so they could stay near their kids. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say that anybody has, nobody has gone to the nine to five situation where nobody has a nanny. Everybody no, secretly no. retreated to their own, they idealized or romanticized mm -hmm. the stay-at-home mom version that they got, and they took that into their career life. Wouldn't you say? Well, I think they all understand it's really an important responsibility to have children. They are not accessories. They are people. And the, the investment that you make in them, the time goes by quickly. And I always say to them, you know, enjoy every single minute of it. But it is really an opportunity uh, that you, you just can't get back, and you don't want to have any regrets about that. What so, she really doesn't understand, though, in this conversation <laughs> is how, for us in this generation that have been working, if we had to stay home all day, we might not ha keep our sanity. That work <laughs> is something that we do. Like, I tell my kids, I go to work, when I, you know, mommy has to go to work today. Why do you have to go to work? I say, I don't go to work because I have to. I go to work because I want to. And that's something they need to understand, that the reason I go to work is because it, in some way I have to have some identity still. But that's what happens when you have kids when you're 40. But you didn't feel that. You didn't have kids when you were 40. You were 35. 37. Well, you know okay. that if you say you were, you know it makes her older, so you don't want to say you're Right. She likes to say I'm her baby. She's a baby. But, right, but, so but, makes her yeah. feel. But, but on, that, on that score... In terms of the children, our, one of our daughters, Jacqueline, who is the middle child, and she, um, she started, which was her dream, she started a, a school called Art Mix, which is, teaches children about art, art appreciation and art, all kinds of mediums and the rest. And it's called Art Mix because her passion is to teach children with special needs, but her idea is to teach them in a setting with other children. And this is what she really wanted to do. And she has three sons. They're now 12, uh, 14, and 16. But at the time, they were obviously younger, 8 to 10 years ago. And she thought it was really important that as little boys that they saw their mother working and that they, they understood that that is what the world was about. And so she didn't think, oh, I wish the kids were bigger so that I could do this. She was like, I think this is an important part of raising my sons, did and you, they helped her Did you her worry work. about that when they were younger, though, about, about that you weren't working, about the girls seeing that you weren't working and being a role model? Let me tell you what it is to have five children in six days. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even wash your face. <laughs> you, it, anything that you might want to do behind a closed door, be that personal or otherwise, forget about it. So it is, it, it's a complete, you, you're not, you know, you are totally immersed. And she really, really deeply loves these kids. Like my kids, when she comes over to play, and my little son said to her last week, like, Mommy, they're playing with Legos on the floor. And then they say, Mimi, why don't you just, she said, I have to go to work now. And they said, Thomas said, Mimi, why don't you just stay here and play with us? And then she said, this is the best invitation I've ever gotten. And she sat back down and played more Legos with them. <laughs> she genuinely has a, I mean, for First, in this generation where we're all stuck on our blackberries and we're all a part of the conversation, it's hard to disconnect the way she can really disconnect and get into those Legos the way I think she, I think she likes kids more than most people do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, when she talks about her whole thing about why she does what she does because she really cares about children, she really does. She loves other people's children more than I think most Women. Well, my whole motivation in politics has always been the one in five children who live in poverty in America. And it is, um, it's really a stunning thing in a country as great as our country is that one in five children go to sleep hungry at night, maybe now one in four. And so what drives me is that, is that I wanted the best for my kids. That meant my taking care of them uh, at the expense of washing my face sometimes. But, but also that, that uh, they should live in a society where other children 
have a chance. And that's what was but so But when you're on the airplane and there's another baby crying the whole ride, my mother is the one that would say, oh, let me, let me help. Let me get in there. Where I'm sitting there, like, oh, how long I'm going to go? I'm going to put on earphones. She is the, she, see what I'm saying? Like, she has a certain well, generation. Well, I, I have a touch. I have a touch. I know that I can make that baby stop crying. But you know, these days you can't. But I, I want to say two things. <laughs> Now, I mean, I'm a mom, right? After all is said and done, I'm a mom. Uh, I, I, uh, there are two things, uh, uh, Lois, that I think are really important, and that is it, for women to really unleash who they are, the, one, the missing link in our society and in our policy and all the rest is the issue of child care. Ninety-some years ago, women got the right to vote. When they did, the paper said women given the right to vote. Women weren't given the right to vote. They fought, they starved, they f argued, they traveled, they worked really hard, and it took decades for women to have the right to vote. And then during World War II, a couple decades later, women were in the workforce. Imagine they had left home, now they were in the workforce um, um, it, it, helping to win the war. Left home, this was revolutionary. And then uh, the higher education of women and now women in the professions, or women staying home, or women in the workforce in whatever level they are. But the missing link in all of that was the issue of child care. And it is something that most other developed countries have recognized the need for. And we have an agenda called, when women succeed, America succeeds. It's about equal pay in the workplace, it's about paid leave, and it's about child care, affordable, it's now called early learning. When we, children learn, parents earn, and, and this is from the earliest stage. So that women don't have to make it, who are these people that my kids are with, I just dropped them off. It's, it's something very high quality and worthy of the children. If we had that, and it's something, we've been going all over the country with a crusade practically on it, it would really make a big difference to not only the women and their families, but our economy in general. And the second thing, and this is really important because both of these things are sort of structural changes that we have to make. The second thing is we need many more women in elective office and in policy making positions. And I promise you this, I know it for an absolute fact, that if you reduce the role of money in politics and increase the level of civility in politics, you will elect many more women. Many more women will come forward because you all have options and we want people with options. So who with options would say, let me see, I wanna subject myself to somebody spending $5 million to misrepresent who I am, to mischaracterize, and this is just for one congressional race, not mention the Speaker of the House or something, which would be a couple hundred million dollars against you. But it, but it really, and the civility is really important. The debate has to be on a level that is um, dignified instead of this back and forth because if men are, they're strong. If women are, it's like, oh my God, that's scary, right, <laughs> <laughs> to them. But, but I, this is really important. We have to do it. We will do it. We must do it. And when we do, we'll have many more women, uh, again, in leadership. It will benefit women in the military, women in government, women in the corporate world. How could we have a Fortune 500 and have 20 CEOs? It's not about lack of talent. We just have to have that recognition that a woman's approach, and whatever time she may have spent at home, counts on her resume. That's not a blank. It's a gold star. It's All right. a gold star. With that, star. since we are we are being um, we are being recorded by C-SPAN, I'm going to have to um, pause, and we're going to bring Susan Molinari into the conversation, a former member of Congress who would yes. like to ask you both a question. We had a baby in Congress, and, yes. and Leader Pelosi would, when I'd walk down the aisle while my, you know, to vote, and my daughter would be crying, would put her hands up, <laughs> take my child, and get her to stop crying. So she does. I bear witness. She's got a gift. Thank you so much, Leader Thank Pelosi you, and um, Alexandra, for being here with us and for sharing that, I mean, just wonderful stories, memories, um, and inspiration. When you leave the stage, we're going to talk a little bit and go into our mentoring sessions around, in each table are ambassadors, and we have ladies set up with people that they think can connect 
um, based on the interest that they have brought to this um, breakfast. And well, I guess we're going into lunch. And so um, as we get into the mentoring session, a session where we talk about how you can help to inspire other young women coming up through, before we let you go off the stage, we wanted to ask if you had, I'm going to start with you, Alexandra, if you have a, a mentoring inspirational story that you can sort of kick us all off with. Well, I've, for the last 12 years, I've been working at HBO. And there's a woman that runs the documentary unit there. named Sheila Nevins. And she just embraced me and supported me the whole time that I was there. And she likes to make jokes, like, what have you done for me but have babies? Because I have, you know, that's a really hard challenge, doing the children and the work. But she's been really supportive. So I'm very grateful to her, I would say. Well, uh, just in terms of Alexandra and her career, I never, in, you know, in other words, you noticed she didn't say I was her mentor, because <laughs> I make it very clear to my daughters, your decisions are your decisions. I wouldn't even dare to express a point of view about it. But my mentor was my mom. <laughs> More on that later. <laughs> I sure hope C-SPAN got that. <laughs> Did you make a face? No. <laughs> you have never inserted your opinions. Never. Judgments. I mean, opinions. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> never. After the fact, maybe, but not. But, but uh, <laughs> my mother, my mother had seven children, six boys. I was the youngest, only girl. Uh, but she was a uh, wife. Of, my father was mayor for 12 years. He was in Congress before that. Susan, you know what that is, having growing up in a family where your father was in Congress as well. And um, uh, she was just the most strategic thinker politically, uh, very strong in the church and all the rest of the Catholic Church. And yet, when that door closed, she was a mom. She was a mom. And, and that just having to be able to balance it all, put certain things on a shelf when you're doing this and others then. And, uh, and so, in any event, uh, I would say my mother uh, was a mentor, having no idea that I would ever run for Congress, but just as, as a person who uh, kept a lot of balls in the air. But I just say this about Susan. So Susan comes to Congress from a very distinguished family in Staten Island. The rest of us have been there. I happen to be the first person whose father served and a daughter served, many fathers and sons in the rest. And so we had to wear dresses. We had the dress coat. You had to wear dresses. So Susan arrives, this young girl, young woman coming to Congress. We had our Italian-American heritage. I immediately embraced her, even though we're of different parties. We had so much more to, uh, uh, to love about each other. And uh, she comes in. Pants. Pants. And it was like, <laughs> no questions asked. She, w she changed everything the day she walked on the floor. And it was not that it was just about the pants. It was emblematic of a new generation, of a young woman coming in who would have babies when she was in the Congress of the United States. So not, she really was our friend. <laughs> not five, But even one. Thank even you. one is a lot. Anyway, but, thank you both so much. Thank, thank you. you. Great fun. Mm -hmm.